May it never become the new normal. At Trafalgar Square this uh, Thursday evening in London, citizens gathering uh, to commemorate and stand in solidarity uh, with the uh, those who've uh, been affected by the rampage that has left four dead and scores injured at Westminster. There you see the uh, mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Uh, this uh, follows the similar rampages at Nice's seaside boardwalk on Bastille Day, the one targeting one of Berlin's signature Christmas markets back in <coughs> December. This time it's that beacon of Western liberal democracy that is the British Parliament that was targeted. We're going to be asking about the arrests and the raids that have followed the attack, about the suspect, and how destroying innocent lives can justify any cause, uh, be it in Baghdad, Kabul, Mogadishu, or London. Twelve years have passed since the 7-7 underground bombings of 2005. What has changed in the UK capital and in Britain more generally? What needs to change? Today in the France 24 debate, what response to the rampage at Westminster with us from London? He's a former parliamentary assistant, Simon Schofield of the Human Security Center. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Thanks as well to Julia Ebner, a policy analyst at the Quilliam uh, Foundation. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Guillaume Dunois de Saint-Marc, who works with uh, victims of terror attacks and is a member of the uh, Radicalization Awareness Network. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see as well uh, academic and filmmaker Asia Mel Difraoui, uh, the uh, senior fellow at the Institute for Media and Communication Policy in Berlin and the author of The Jihad of Images, Al-Qaeda's Prophecy of Martyrdom. The, the uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Uh, let's dip in now and listen to the mayor of London. At, at the same time, they encourage others to run for safety. London is a great city, full of amazing people from all backgrounds. And when Londoners face adversity, we always pull together. We stand up for our values and we show the world we are the greatest city in the world. Our response to this attack on our city, to this attack on our way of life, to this attack on our shared values, shows the world what it means to be a Londoner. Thank you. All right, there you heard it, uh, the, the mayor of London uh, speaking. Uh, four killed, including the attacker, uh, 29 hospitalized from 11 nationalities. We have a claim of responsibility by ISIS, eight arrests on raids in six locations in the UK capital, but also in the city of Birmingham. And amid it all, this hashtag on social media, London is open. The British displaying their trademark phlegm in the face of adversity. Shirley Sitbon has more. A minute of silence. And back to business. British MPs were deeply shocked by Wednesday's attack. But reopening Parliament was a matter of principle. The Parliament was targeted because of what it symbolizes. For Prime Minister May, suspending debates would have sent a bad signal. Mr. Speaker, yesterday an act of terrorism tried to silence our democracy. But today we meet as normal, as generations have done before us and as future generations will continue to do, to deliver a simple message. We are not afraid. Theresa May called on all British people to send the same message. Millions of people are going about their days and getting on with their lives. It is in these actions Millions of acts of normality 
that we find the best response to terrorism. Beyond Westminster walls, the atmosphere was anything but normal. In mourning and largely shut down for security reasons, the neighborhood was unusually quiet. I think it's very apprehensive at the moment. People are anxious. They don't know what's happening. But I think uh, certainly from all the social media and news, we're, we're being kept informed, which is important. Uh, I think people probably do feel that there's an element of, of fear, but really, uh, we won't let this beat us. Police paid tribute to their fallen colleague, stabbed to death while protecting Parliament. Never ceasing their mission, they got special moral support from the Queen herself, who thanked security forces in the name of the nation. Simon Schofield, as somebody uh, who knows that building well, what, what was your first reaction when, when this unfolded? Sheer horror. I have a lot of, of friends and colleagues in, inside that building, and obviously you, you, your mind goes to the worst-case scenario, doesn't it? Uh, in, in the case of uh, what we've seen the last 24 hours, uh, is well, how would you characterize the mood today in the wake of, as we were saying at the outset, of uh, all the, the fact that we've had similar attacks in, in other major European cities in the, over the past year? The, the mood is somber. I think that's undeniable. But at the same time, there's very much a spirit of business as usual. And I think it's the single greatest way that we can respond to this kind of attack is to say that democracy rolls on no matter what you do. Right now, it's still a piecemeal, uh, Julia Ebner. Uh, what we know, uh, we have the identity of a suspect. Uh, he uh, uh, has a, cr a long criminal record. Uh, he was somebody who had been investigated in the past but wasn't seen as a prime suspect. One of the things that's surprising is his age, 52 years old. Is that unusual? That is, um, compared to what we've seen in, most, in the most recent attacks, that is relatively old, yes, indeed. That is rather surprising because I think the typical uh, age of also foreign fighters, for example, was rather in between, um, well, in, most of the fighters were in their 20s, um, some of them even younger. So I think the age is a factor that, that might be surprising, but definitely not this crime uh, terrorism nexus that we've seen in over half of, uh, of the attacks that have happened in recent years, according to a study that came out from King's College. Uh, at the outset, uh, on Wednesday, authorities treating it as a lone wolf incident. Of course, since then, we've had arrests. So what can we say on that score? I would say lone wolf is maybe the wrong term because clearly there was some form of ideological inspiration that was driving the perpetrator, um, that of Islamist extremism. And although ISIS has maybe claimed the attack, probably it was not orchestrated by ISIS, um, but very much hijacked in a way, as they so often do. But of course... Uh, a lone wolf attack um, would be something that would be completely isolated from these forms of, of ideological influence. And I think um, there have probably been, I mean, there's still, the investigations are still underway, but as we see that uh, eight houses have been raided uh, across the country, I think there, there is uh, a network, some form of support network uh, is something that the police forces currently, the security forces are expecting. Uh, the uh, the uh, security forces are still investigating at, at this point in time. Asya Meldifrawi, what strikes you about this case? Uh, how the fact that the 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 attacker was uh, was able to to get into to, to at least to get onto the premises of the the House of of Commons, of course, is 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 one thing that struck us. The other that um, he didn't have a gun this time; it was just with knives. Frankly speaking, um, this might um, sound a little dis disillusioned. Nothing strikes me about this attack in terms of um, a particular attack. We have seen this pattern before. Um, we've seen it in Berlin. We have seen it in Nice. We have seen it with um, um, attacks uh, which didn't kill so many people. Um, it's an attack pattern which is desired by the Islamic State, which has been called for, so there's nothing really new about it. What strikes me is that we are doing the same coverage of these events 
all the time. We don't do media coverage about the root causes of jihadism. I haven't seen um, so far a reportage about East London or Birmingham, um, about um, um, the local um, uh, local sympathizers for jihad, about um, why those people turn to uh, this kind of form of violent extremism and so on. So we are confronted with um, j um, jihadism, which is a global phenomenon, but which is also a global phenomenon, and which is a local phenomenon. And no, uh, or nearly no European country has been um, safe from those attacks. And we're still discussing each single attack simply as a news event. Um, I would like to talk about the root causes, what happened. All right, Why so on, on that point, on that point, uh, the, uh, the head, one of the heads of uh, MI5 saying that he's, he's seen right now the, the level of uh, activity uh, among uh, uh, would-be attackers at, at an all-time high. Why is that? Okay, that's a very, very important question. I mean, um, um, which isn't um, at all easy to answer, you know. But um, I mean, the interesting thing is, um, our colleague from London was speaking about this nexus between crime and jihadism. That's something very important. We need to find out why certain pathologies or people who have psychological problems have been um, have been um, petty criminals or violent criminals are so seduced uh, by jihadism. Does it have anything to do um, with um, the current situation in Syria? Uh, maybe but it also has something to do maybe with growing Islamophobia in Europe, with um, the fact that um, with this, this uh, wrong salvation myth the Islamic State is promoting, um, find some um, attraction among those people. And that's something we really need to look much deeper in there. You know, How comes that, um, um, that um, um, a young German, um, a British-born, um, a British born, maybe Pakistani, um, a French born uh, Moroccan, um, try to commit the same times of the attack. So, I mean, we really need to go down to the bottom of it at some, some stage. And these attacks will continue to happen until we really um, fight um, jihadism and all its causes, meaning socioeconomic um, exclusion, meaning um, the sense of exclusion of some people, meaning as well, obviously, an ideological confrontation and a military confrontation with um, the so called Islamic State in Syria. All right, we, we see uh, reactions on, on the hashtag F24 debate. Jessica saying they say the London terrorists worked alone, maybe has no ties to ISIS, but was surely inspired by them. There was a claim of responsibility over one of the propaganda networks uh, used by the jihadists. Uh, the, the points there made by Asiyam El Difraoui, uh, that wasn't the way they were pitched. And we saw that first candidates debate uh, earlier this week here in France ahead of the presidential election. That conversation isn't happening, is it? Uh, I think what is important to, 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 to see that uh, we are in, uh, in front of uh, an ideology who is trying to, to push away uh, our, our uh, democracy, our way of living. And if we just look as isolated acts and not look at, we have to co be confronted to a complete ideology. They, not, they know what they want to achieve. That making different ways to, to do, they want to use democracy or to they, use. They know our weaknesses and they know, for example, that like right wing populism is one of their best friends yes, in of order course. to recruit better. Yeah. So, and we need to have uh, an open and, debate. And also, in the same time, we cannot see that all, all this, the solution is about sociology because a lot of persons have many difficulties. I'm not big, I don't become a jihadist or don't uh, believe in this ideology. So, we really have to fight uh, all sorts of. Uh, uh, jihadism, but also uh, the Salafism uh, and, and all these uh, different kind of way of uh, thinking the same ideology. If we don't fight on a legal aspect when it's out of, it's illegal, but also on, uh, on confrontation of ideology uh, by talking, by discussing, they say, I do not agree when it's not Ill illegal, but we have to, fi to fight all together in Europe and in, in every country against this, uh, the, the Salafism. The Salafism in the global is a problem. S some, some of the, this... Let's Salaf just explain for our viewers here, just so that they know, what's the difference between jihadism and Salafism? Uh, the ideology is not compatible with the values uh, uh, we want to defend. Uh, they, they can have these beliefs, if that's not illegal, but if, when they want to achieve and push away our beliefs or our way of living, uh, by using our weaknesses or uh, by fighting or putting bombs, then it's, it's, it becomes a problem. It means that we have to be together to defend the values. Uh, we didn't do enough of uh, counter-propaganda or defending uh, our way of living. Uh, 
and we were not vigilant enough uh, by many signs of attacking our uh, our society, uh, and we didn't defend it uh, enough. And it's not too late, but we really have to be uh, very careful and defend our values. I, the, the yeah, I would like I like to be very precise about some definitions. Salafism is, um, for the most part, a non-violent ideology, um, which yeah. doesn't respect democracy. So we need to distinguish it really from jihadism, which is violent, and it, that's for sure. It, it's not but illegal, that's, 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 that's but the first, ideology that's, that's a, can be. Well, yeah, but let me let me finish the other thing, and I'm very unhappy about this word counter propaganda. The jihadis have like a totalitarian narrative, yeah, which is very seductive. We shouldn't do counter propaganda. We need to you push our own narrative, I agree what with our you. societies, what our values about, and reach those people who are seduced by this very totalitarian. All right, Ju Julia, world Julia Abner. I, I totally agree. Yes. Julia Abner, well, are we say, having are we having yes. the wrong conversation? Well, first of all, I would also like to make the distinction between pietist Salafism and jihadi Salafism. I think jihadist Salafism is just one manifestation of Salafism. The link is ideological. I agree with you on that. But um, I think there is, uh, it's really important to keep uh, a very nuanced um, language also in this debate because that's exactly also the problem that we face with, uh, with the far right, mixing up Islam with Islamist extremism. And the same is true for mixing up uh, pietist uh, Salafism with jihadi Salafism. I think it's important to, to uh, have a very nuanced debate on this. And also, I think, um, of course, there are various, it's such a complex uh, topic and this whole radicalization cocktail is for us at the Quillian Foundation, we see it almost, um, yeah, it consists of four factors. Basically, you have grievances that feed into it. You have uh, identity crisis issues, the sense that, um, that you can't be Muslim and British or European at the same time. And that is something... Um, uh, as, as one of you mentioned, with the, the problem with the far right is essentially that their uh, narrative of the West is, uh, or Islam is at war with the West, or that there is no compatible way of reconciling Islam with Western values, that very much feeds into these identity crises. And of course, that is on the very on, on the basic level. And once there are grievances and identity crises within minority communities, then it's easy for a charismatic recruiter to come and have a narrative, an Islamist extremist ideology that lures these vulnerable individuals into extremist networks. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that's why it's important to have a full spectrum approach that really goes into all these different factors. And all, that's all these why factors. Uh, us, Simon, yeah. Simon Schofield, do you agree? No. I do not agree. Absolutely. I think I agree with everything that's been said there by Julie. I think it's all very well, uh, former President Obama declaring an end to the, the global war on terror, but it hasn't stopped terror's global war on us. Um, and I think it's very clear that we're in a, a sort of war of ideas of sorts and that we have to prove that uh, liberal democracy is, is the best solution. And, and it, it all hinges on the treatment of the other. Is In liberal democracy, if you disagree with one another, you, ha you have a debate and at some point you agree to disagree. Um, mm. Under fundamentalist um, interpretations, be that sort of far right or, or Islamist, um, if, if you disagree, then you're, you're not only wrong, but you're fair game. You're fair game for, for violent coercion. And, and I think that's, that's the aspect that we need to fight, is we need to make it very clear that that's not the way we treat people that disagree with us. And it's, it's not the way that we will tolerate others uh, treating people who disagree with them. All right. When we come back, we're going to uh, um, we're going to go to uh, Trafalgar Square, where our correspondent uh, Duncan Woodside is standing by, and and again, uh, go further on this point of how Britain, how Europe has changed in its attitude to all of this since uh, that first attack 12 years ago on the London Underground. <laughs> 